thank you all so much for attending and for joining us tonight for this very special panel um, in celebration of the show, um, Protecting Wisdom, Tibetan Book Covers from the McLean Collection. And I just wanted, as many of you hopefully have seen tonight, the present the exhibition showcases elaborately, very elaborately decorated and carved book covers from Tibet from the 11th to the 18th centuries. We are joined by very three special guests and who will each be speaking on a different aspect of the exhibition and on the, on the book covers and some more context about the collection, the McLean collection that they come from. And after the three short presentations they will give, we will be followed by hopefully a question and answer session with you, our audience. So our first speaker will be Dr. Richard Pegg, um, who is, again, mentioned director and curator of Asian art at the McLean Asian Art Museum in Chicago, um, as well as director of the library as well, and we'll hear more about that. Um, he has a PhD in East Asian art history from Columbia and also a BA and master's in Chinese and Japanese literature and philosophy from George Washington University. University. Our second speaker will be Dr. Catherine Selick Brown, and she is an independent curator and Asian art consultant, uh, a former curator of the Rubin. Um, she's also curated more than a dozen exhibitions, and she has spoken widely um, at the Metropolitan, at the Art Institute of Chicago, also published very widely as well. And our third uh, speaker will be Mr. Barry McLean. As we mentioned, he is the renowned collector and wonderful. Um, of the renowned collector of all the book covers, as well as also a variety of different aspects of Asian art. Um, I understand your collection is quite diverse. So he will be speaking more about his passion for collecting, and we look forward to hearing from, about more about that. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to start our presentations and invite Mr. or Dr. Pegg to the stage. Thank you. First off, I'd really like to thank uh, Amy and Jacqueline and all of the staff here for um, all of their uh, collaborative efforts in uh, putting this up. Uh, this is exactly the kind of venue that we wanted it to be, where you had a kind of intimate space and you could really get a chance to get to know this material. Uh, prior to this project, no one had ever done anything on Tibetan book covers. There was one German book done in 1993, uh, which had mostly wrong dates and all sorts of inaccuracies. Um, and I'll get to it in a moment. And um, even Catherine, when I first approached her about doing this project, uh, I said, would you like to do a book on Tibetan book covers? She said, I don't think so. Um, and I said, you know what, why don't I uh, buy you a plane ticket? She lives in Connecticut now. Uh, come to Chicago. And I picked her up at the airport, and we drove down, and uh, uh, Barry's wife, Mary Ann, uh, they have an apartment downtown, and they put 35 book covers along one wall. And so Catherine walked in, and she didn't even make it a quarter of the way. And she looked at this vista, and she said, I'm in. And so eight years later, the catalog um, came out. So it's been a labor of love, and we're, we're so happy that it's, it's finally on the road so that we can uh, share it with a much wider audience. My purpose is to talk a little bit about the McLean Collection and who we are and what we do. Uh, I like to start with, from the Asian art side, the very first object that uh, Barry bought in Thailand, we think about 1973. Um, in Bangkok, carried on the plane in a shopping bag, brought home. Uh, he likes to tell the story. His, he put it in a window, and his housekeeper put a plant in it and watered the plant, and the bottom fell out. And so it has been repaired, uh, but it is what we like to call the, the object that began the obsession uh, with Asian art, uh, pottery in particular, which led into bronze, which led into sculpture, uh, ultimately in the late 90s into Tibetan book covers. So the museum itself was finished uh, January 2004. It's a purpose-built building in the woods of northern Illinois. It's surrounded by Forest Preserve, and it's in Barry and Marianne's backyard. Uh, this is our storage area. It's an open storage area, two floors. Uh, this is one view looking towards the museum. Here's the front entrance. So essentially, the, when I took this photograph, I was standing in their driveway. Uh, right behind me is their house. Uh, this is our main gallery, and you see um, uh, 
a number of things, including this uh, 17th century Chinese wall that's about 23 feet tall. Uh, this is our dedicated bell and drum gallery, bronzes. And then one of the exteriors, the entire exteriors, you can see we have architectural fragments and sculpture uh, lining uh, all around the building. I only have 15 minutes, so I'm only going to sort of give you an overview, a gloss of, of what we do. Uh, so, so here is, again, one of the great strengths. Uh, on the walls are bells of primarily southwestern China and southeast Asia. Uh, the collection is about 5,000 objects. Um, about half of it is Chinese. And what you're looking at here is a mix and a particular interest of, of Barry's uh, is bronze. And this entire gallery is dedicated just to percussive instruments. We have another bronze gallery that's dedicated to vessels uh, of Southeast Asia as well as China. And again, uh, blow up of our main gallery, there's that wall. Here's uh, a um, terracotta uh, Buddha, Gandharan, some of this Banchang pottery, like the blackware that you saw uh, in the first slide. Uh, we also have an apartment built in, and these are for visitors, visiting scholars, uh, photographers, uh, book designers, all of these people associated with the projects that we do. Uh, this is a place for them to stay, and so here you see the bedroom. Uh, this is our the conference room. Uh, the fire is not a real fire. That's put in by a photographer. Uh, it was a nice idea, but because the building is airtight, anybody who knows anything about a fireplace, if you don't have a draft, the entire building fills up with fire. And I think the fire, we had the fire department, no, twice. We, the architect said, oh, no, there's vents on the sides. And so we tried that, and so the fire department came a second time. Um, so we don't actually have fires in the space, but um, you, you begin to see a, a little bit of, of how beautiful the space is. Uh, our first exhibition that we toured was our passion for form, and this was um, Southeast Asian material that traveled um, to Utah and to the Honolulu Academy of Arts. And here we are at the opening. There's me, here's Barry and Mary Ann and Steve Little, who was the director of the museum at the time. Uh, and so this installation actually was the one in Utah, and this is the catalog that we did for that show. Uh, the next book we did was on our Chinese bronze collection, and that's about 81 objects. Um, Co-written, I was the co-author as the art historian with an archeologist, so you have both sides to Chinese archeology. span um, anyone who's read anything by a Chinese archaeologist, it's um, slow going unless you are a Chinese archaeologist. Uh, but I, this, I think we provide a nice balance. And this was actually the first, so this would be about eight years ago. And this is what I approached Amy about. And we talked about maybe we'd do a show of this. And um, that never materialized. But then we had the Tibetan book cover book come out. And that seemed to be a good, really good match. And then this uh, is the catalog that we produced for that. Catherine was the author. Uh, it won a number of uh, worldwide design awards. Um, it was, uh, one of them was the top 50 books printed worldwide in 2013. Uh, and so we were very happy. All the graphic design people all know who the AIGA is. Um, and so it's a very prestigious um, award. It also won... It was printed in Canada, it won the Gold Star in Canada, it won uh, for the American Museums uh, book competition, annual book competition uh, as well. Then we switch over to the map side. So the map collection, I've been the director now for two years. Um, so Barry began collecting Asian art, we think in the early 70s-ish. That's the first one that we can sort of date. Uh, we went into the database. Um, the map collection is, we think, and it seems to be fairly uh, uh, well recognized, that it's the largest private collection of maps in the world. Uh, we're guesstimating it's about 45 to 50,000 maps. We've cataloged 37,000. Uh, we have a set of full-time catalogers who are still working on it. Uh, but this is one of the first ones that we found in the database. November 1968, 
uh, a map from Ken Nebensall, who is still a very well-known dealer of, of maps based in Chicago. And this is actually uh, an advertisement for a trip around the world um, sponsored by Rock Island Pacific Railroad. So you begin in Chicago and you take, you go due west to San Francisco. Then you take a boat to Yokohama and then you go to Shanghai and you make your way all the way through the Malay Peninsula to India, through the Suez Canal, back through Europe, through France, and then leave from Britain, sail on to New York, and then back to Chicago. You can't read the fine print, but right over here it tells you it's $1,600 in 1870. Um, so this was the beginning of Barry's map collecting. So we're putting it at 50 plus years. Um, this is uh, a few shots of our, this is the globe room, a room completely dedicated to globes including a pair of 1623 celestial and terrestrial globes, a Coronelli globe from the late 17th century, uh, etc. This is some of uh, the collections in our rare maps. Um, I think our earliest is late 15th century, and so that material is, is housed in this space. And then you see this is uh, powder horns from the French and Indian War. Uh, you see wall maps, uh, one of the great focuses within the collection um, maybe seven or 8,000 wall maps, 19th century, American commercial uh, map uh, publication is, is definitely a focus within our collection. Uh, and then two years ago, uh, I did our first book on the map side. It happens to be that uh, we have a pretty decent collection of East Asian maps. Uh, and so the inspiration for this was an article um, a publication asked me to compare Chinese, Japanese, and Korean maps. I said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And I began to do a little research. Uh, no book on this topic has ever been done. There are books on Chinese maps and books on Japanese maps and books on Korean maps, but no one had considered the region as a whole, what's distinctive about uh, map production in East Asia, and then within East Asia, what's distinctive about Chinese, Japanese versus Korean. And so I teased some of that out using the maps that are in our collection. Uh, and so this book came out uh, two years ago, and I give you an example. This is a Japanese map plate from the 1830s, of which we have three in the collection. This is a, a Korean map uh, of the peninsula from the 1860s. And then this very well-known uh, blue map from 1810 of the world uh, from a Chinese perspective that goes from Korea to England and Holland uh, up here in this corner. Uh, you'll notice there are no borders. This is the Chinese perspective on their sphere of influence, the places that they have a relationship with. Uh, and it's a reproduction of a map that was done earlier in the Qianlong reign in, the, in 1767. And I could go on quite a bit about maps. Um, in that vein, our next exhibition, this is a big year for us. We have six shows on the road that we're either lending to or are the primary uh, sponsor for this show. And then in June, we have an exhibition of Japanese maps that'll be opening up at the Art Institute. And so it's the first exhibition in this country dedicated just to the theme of Japanese maps. Here's a world map. Uh, produced in 1810 in Japan, a map from the uh, 1850s of Yokohama, the first port that was opened uh, after the Ansei treaties, a map of Kyoto from the late 17th century, another variety of map plate, this one in a Kutani style over glaze enamel. Uh, and then you have an example of a 1710 map of the Buddhist world. And so as you would imagine, Asia is the primary focus the Americas, North America and South America, are two little dots over here. All of Europe is re represented in four or five little islands over here. Uh, again, it's the sphere of influence of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, the, the southern continent is where we exist in a Buddhist construct. There are uh, four uh, continents, and so that's what's de depicted in this. Thank you all for coming tonight. This is a very, very exciting evening for me as a Tibetologist to have so many book covers in one place. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Richard.
Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jacqueline. And again, thank you all for coming tonight. I, I can't tell you how special this is. As Richard has already said, this is the first museum exhibition of Tibetan book covers in the United States, possibly in the world. I can't speak for Europe, but at least here. And I, I hope some of you have gotten a chance to go through the galleries. If you haven't, hopefully after you see some of these highlights, you will go down. So just to give you a, a quick overview, um, this is an, an anatomy of what a Tibetan book um, would look like. So this is the book cover. Wait, this is a top book cover, the bottom book cover, a stack of manuscript pages in between that were often covered by silk. And then the whole thing was bound together by a leather strap with a, a metal buckle. And coming out the front would have been a flap that had information on what was in the volume, the author, the contents. But also right along here, which is what I call the short side edge, is also a lot of information is encoded. So when you go down to the exhibition, make sure you look at these little edges. And just to show you, so this is what books looked like in a, in a monastery in bookshelves. This is, um, I shot these in Ladakh in 1997, not having any idea that I would be working on books 20 years later. And um, books are very sacred in Tibetan Buddhism, and they're usually placed right near the altar. This is the main prayer hall at um, Tikse Monastery, and then you can get a close-up look. So you see the upper cover, the lower cover, the manuscript pages wrapped in silk, with then these flaps coming off the front with um, information. And actually, these white scarves are simply um, prayer scarves that were donated by the faithful. Um, I, I do want to stress that not all Tibetan books had the carving and painting that you are going to see here and downstairs in the exhibition. These are all very um, precious books. Many of them were ceremonial, and they were all for Buddhist or the indigenous religion of the Himalayas, Bun, for um, those two religions. So this is a 12th to 13th century cover. And from the outside, you can see that it received a lot of use. Right here, you can see this where this edge, that's where the leather strap was wrapped around. So this was not a book that sat ceremoniously on a shelf and was brought out once a year. Someone really used this all the time. And so this is the inside face. So this is the outside face and the inside. So this is what faced the manuscript pages. And you would only see this carving when you open the book. And it would be for only a brief time because a monk would take off the top cover and then after you've unwrapped the silk, place the first page of the manuscript manuscript down. So it was only in that brief instant that you would ever get to see this carving. And um, so many of the book covers downstairs, the carving and the decoration is actually on this inside face where the carving paid homage to the Buddha's words. Um, you have here the four directional Buddhas. This is carved down three quarters of an inch. And the Buddhas on the side are carved down a half an inch. So you really have this feeling of almost objects in the round. And um, as Richard mentioned briefly, uh, they had uh, great photography taken. And so I spent three years looking at very detailed photographs of these and exploring them. And I discovered so many interesting um, enlightening, lively um, details, I would say. So we're about to just look right under this Buddha, this Buddha, and this Buddha. Now, normally under um, seated Buddhas, you would have uh, throne animals that are simply facing you and just kind of standing there like sculptures. But instead, the artist who created this, first of all, I don't know if you can see how deeply carved these little tiny lines are. I mean, these guys are like a half an inch tall. But notice they're smiling at each other and kicking their legs out at each other. And then, um, so the, uh, 
animal associated with Akshobhya Buddha is this elephant. Um, and you can see the elephants coming out of these swirling kind of foliate forms. And then down here under Amoga City, the Buddha of the North, you have Shang Shang, which uh, this is the Tibetan version of a Garuda, the Indian Garuda, which is a half man, half bird. And here it's a male and female pair. And I just love how they're here kind of holding up the foliage. So this is the short side edge that I was talking about on um, the book cover. So remember, this is an inch and a half high. And um, in the center is what is likely to be the temple at Bodh Gaya in northeastern India where Buddha Shakyamuni achieved enlightenment. And indeed, you see him with his hand touching the earth, calling the earth goddess to witness his right to achieve enlightenment. And um, coming out from this temple is a lotus vine with three additional Buddhas on either side and then two reliquary structures. And it's possible that these represent the eight great events of the Buddha's life, but um, not 100% certain. This cover, I, I, I could go on and on. I could talk for an hour. I know I only have 15 minutes. This is another um, 13th to 14th century cover. And um, again, as I said, this is on the inside face. So it would have been seen momentarily. And it has lots of um, very interesting, mysterious carving. I've shown this cover to uh, many people and nobody understands why this carving is this way. I'll get to it in a minute. So in the center, you have Prajna Paramita. She's the goddess of transcendent wisdom. And again, she's carved a half an inch down. Um, so what is so interesting is to either side of her are the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. And you can see on this side, there's this beautiful lotus stalk brimming with lotus buds and Buddhas, and you can see them each supported here, whereas on the right side, the Buddhas aren't supported at all. There's just kind of random foliage behind. I don't know why. And underneath Prajnaparmita, usually I've just shown you Buddhas on a throne. So you have a big throne and then the animals associated with the Buddha underneath. But here we have two different types of foliage again on either side, a kind of wider one and a very tightly carved one. Not sure why. I don't know whether the carver was um, referring to two different teachings, or, but it makes for beautiful viewing. Here's a detail of, if I go back, so we're going to look at this area right here. This is Shakyamuni Buddha. And to either side of him are stacked up the eight symbols of good fortune. And the manner in which this parasol was carved and the manner in which the Buddha's head was carved is how I dated the cover. Because parasols changed in form in the centuries afterwards. So what is so interesting here is so to either side of these are two vialas. And if you notice right there, there's another viala just hanging out, an Indian viala, because, of course, Tibetan Buddhism came from India. And so they adopted a lot of Indian iconography and ways of depicting things. So the viala on the left, it's a composite beast. It has the head of a ram and often the body of a lion, has larger horns than this one. It has a larger head. And notice the tails are often, are, are very different. And I noticed on another book cover in the collection carved 300 years later that you have the exact same manner of depicting these vialas. So clearly there was a text out there that told you how to depict them, but I don't know why. And here's one of my favorite parts. I love this guy hanging on. You see, with his arm, he's hanging around the viala's neck, hanging on to his hat, and he's wearing a Tibetan robe, which is called a chuba. 
And so just these, just, I'm trying to give you an idea of the delight that I kept finding. I would just start exploring these book covers. And to me, they really remind me of medieval manuscripts. Do you know how you have kind of animals and figures coming in and out? It's the same general idea. And I like to think that the artisans put them in there for these monks who were in monasteries for decades. And this might have been some kind of visual levity or something for them to enjoy. Um, on the bottom, you have two elephants. If you notice, they're depicted like cats and dogs, the way they're crouching here. But elephants bend their knees the other way, right? And so clearly this artist had never seen a real live elephant before. Do you see this? Look at these. Yeah, they look like little dogs with elephant trunks. Okay, so this, this is really an, an incredible book cover um, uh, that Barry just knew that this was something special. I mean, he said he bought it because he liked the carving. Well, it turns out to be a very important piece in Tibetan art history. And the reason why is, is Tibetan artists um, copied styles for centuries. And there's very few dated pieces. So as art historians, we're always trying to date things by putting together all the little details. And in the entire history of Tibetan art, right now we have, I don't know, less than 100 dated pieces. And in terms of book covers, there's only a few in the world that actually have dates. Now, so this is the, ins the outside face of the book cover. This is the inside face of the book cover that's painted with 18 Buddhas. And running along the base is a Tibetan inscription. And this inscription says that um, the book cover was made by the Supreme Person Aglen. Now, Aglen is somebody... Um, it's a very uncommon name. So I was able to find him in Tibetan history. And, um, wait, hold on. He was the head administrator of central Tibet. And he is said to have introduced to Tibet the use of boats for ferrying across rivers. Before boats, they used yak hides that were blown up and, and that were coracles. That's all they had. He was also the grandson of the man who performed Tibet's census in 1268. Now, we know that in 1290, together with Mongol troops, Aglen commanded forces in a military victory. And at some point after this victory, he was appointed to an even higher position in the government um, in 1295. But by 1298, somebody else was in this position, which means he had died. Therefore, we can date this book cover to the last decade of the 13th century, which is a very special thing. But what's even more eye-opening about it is everybody who had seen this cover, including myself, thought that it was a mid-14th century cover. And it was sold by a well-known New York um, auction house. And if they had had any idea that this was 13th century and not 14th century, they would have said so and totally raised the prices because 13th century objects are way rarer than 14th century objects. So um, this is really a special piece. He bought five covers with inscriptions, and these inscriptions have provided so much information about how these objects were made. Um, I talk about it a little in the exhibition, but one of the labels, one of the inscriptions actually thanks the matron who prepared all the food for the people who made the books. Because in order to make Tibetan books, there were often hundreds of people working together. Um, I found lists that list, list over 400 people who had gathered together to make the books. So this is a, let me just back up. I'm showing you a close-up of this area right here. So um, you can see one of these typical thrones 
um, with lions facing. The inscription mentions that there are strong men and lions, and you can see the strong men under here. The inscription also mentions that there are elephants, deer, peacocks, and monkeys, all well arranged and painted with pleasing gold. Now, this is interesting. Um, three of the five inscriptions mention animals and these things that I discovered are called petra, which are spirals. Now, if you look here, we have deer and horse and lions, and a peacock with its tail feathers spread, and a monkey. And so spread continuously throughout the background of this book cover is this entire menagerie. And clearly this form of decoration was important to the patrons because they included it in the inscription. Also included in the inscriptions were the fact that the cover was made from wood and that it was covered in gold. And wood is important because there's no trees on the Tibetan plateau. So all the wood for these book covers had to be hauled over the Himalayan mountains on muleback. So you can imagine how valuable they were. Okay, I'm going to end with these two pieces. Um, again, I could talk forever. Um, so these book covers are, um, it turns out, part of a series of volumes that have been spread all over the world. Barry bought both of these at different times. But when I started researching them, I found these two ones. You can see they're very similar um, with figures in the middle and surrounded by Buddhas. And there's an, uh, yet a fifth one in the Museum of Asian Art in Turin in Italy. And I was very lucky because underneath the figures, I'll show you a close-up in a minute, is an inscription that identifies them. So by piecing together who these two figures are, along with the other three covers, I was able to discover that they were once um, book covers for a, manus a tantric manuscript called The Cycle of the Brahmin. And the Cycle of the Brahmin is a text that was bought, brought to Tibet in the 8th century by a man who was actually in the center of one of the other covers. Now, so I'm going to talk more about him, but just to tell you, the figure on the bottom is Shankton Trubar. He lived from 1053 to 1135. And he was the teacher of one of the founders of one of the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And um, he is also known as being an expert practitioner of the cycle of the Brahmin. I read this in a text, and um, he learned it from his grandfather. So, is this not fabulous? 15th century painting. And um, so this, the inscription underneath him, you can see it right here. It actually just says that it his, he's Dramze, which means the Brahmin in Tibetan. But his name is Dramze Demchag Ningpo. And um, you can tell that he was an Indian yogi because... First of all, he's very gaunt. You can see the bones in his arms and his legs. He's wearing very little clothing. He's wearing bone ornaments. He has piled up beautifully depicted hair. I just love his wild beard. And um, he's holding with his delicately extended pinky a human thigh bone trumpet. And he's holding a human skull cup up to his heart that's filled with blood. And these were ritual objects that were used by tantric practitioners because they're trying to achieve enlightenment in one lifetime. I could go on for an hour about that, but um, so, well, actually... I could end right here. If you want to hear more, come back on June 9th when I'm going to speak for an hour. Well, I, uh, I'm going to speak from here. I have no slides. And I just want to thank you very much for giving us the privilege of showing you what we've learned about book covers. And it's been a privilege to work with the two of you. Um, a little background of why do you do this? Why do you collect objects of art or such objects as Asian art and maps? I'm the product of a mother that was an historian had a graduate degree in history and English. 
way back in 1925. And a father was an engineer. And I happen to be an engineer also. And engineers like to know where they are, where they're going, what's up, you know, what's it look like upside down. I also uh, had the benefit as a kid working in a basement, building things out of wood and metal and so on. So I was a practitioner of building things all the time. And so unless, as I sort of could afford to buy something and had a love to buy something, I was focused on shape, form, function. How does it look? What's the patina? How does it feel if you can touch it? It was those things that turned me on about finding something that was historically interesting and had this form and function aspect to it. And I think it's interesting that lots of things that are now considered art forms were something that were quite functional at one time, as in the case of these book covers, where you can think of vessels that were used by someone in ancient China, or a basket that might be made in the Philippines today that carries grain or, or some sort of food products, and yet it's an elegant, beautiful piece of, of art in, in the way we would look at it. So I, I focus really in collecting over time on things generally, not always, of course, that were useful in some other aspect of their life. And that's been a great privilege for me to find Richard, uh, to find Catherine. I mean, Richard found Catherine. But then we try to share uh, what we've learned about these art forms with other people through books and experiences like this. So it's been a wonderful journey, and uh, I look forward to more of it. And uh, let's...